Welcome to the Six Again Get to Know series, where we chat with NRL personalities from players to coaches to journalists. Let's kick off. All right, guys, this is our third interview of, um, of the show, and we're lucky enough to have James Jimmy Maloney joining us all the way from France. So, how you doing, James? Yeah, not too bad, guys. Trying to trying to keep the head above water in lockdown, but doing the best. <laughs> and what you were saying, you've been locked down for almost five weeks now, so we've already established you've had an in-home haircut and you've got four kids running around, so you're looking a lot better than I would. <laughs> yeah, mate, it's, it's, get, it's getting to that point where it's, yeah, it's getting a bit tough at times. So, um, yeah, as, as we were sort of talking about, you know, obviously had family and that um, people due to come over and um, visit and that. So when you sort of think of the alternative of how life would be if, yeah. you know, you had family coming over and still get out and do stuff, you know, that's a bit depressing. But, um, yeah, it's just one of those things, isn't it? You know, yeah. as soon as you start looking at the things you can't control, it's it gets a bit depressing as soon as you can sort of, you know, pull your mind back and go, well, you know what, this is this is what it is and find the positives and, yeah, you know, it makes it a little bit easier to get by. That's it. Jared, keep so, yourself, buddy. One of the first things we'd like to know, because we're just fans, we just don't know yeah. the processes behind the doors and stuff like that. So, obviously, you transfer between, what, this is your sixth club you've played for in professional rugby league. Yeah, um, probably. So, yeah, so probably. probably. <laughs> <laughs> so, what 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 is the process like from when you get the first phone call to sign with a club to actually walking through the front door? Like, can you run us through probably? Yeah, what what is the things that people don't hear about it? Because all we hear about is rumors and stuff like that, and then they yeah. go, "Oh, they're signed." <laughs> yeah, it's probably well. It probably gets to a point. Obviously, the regulations in the NRL was basically, you know, now that for a player, once you enter the final year of your contract, then, you know, you have permission, you know, to talk um, to other clubs. So obviously there's lead up talk and that obviously, you you know, you're in constant communication with the club you're at. Um, and, you know, obviously salary cap and all that plays a huge role at the moment yeah. uh, these days in the NRL. So, um, yeah, you sort of get to the, get to the point and you, um, you know, start talking with your manager about, you know, what you think, you know, what, what you want to do, you know, where, whether you want to stay, whether you want to go, what sort of, um, you know, financial, uh, you know, the contract, how, how much you sort of think, think you're worth and think is fair and um, all that. And, and then obviously it, it gets to a position where you, you know, depending on the club, you know, then the club sort of from their perspective, they, they're sort of obviously tossing up between, you know, well, okay, we've got him. These are other options we've got. You know, we want him to stay. It'll cost X amount. You know, we've got other people we could get, could do that. And obviously that's a, a balancing act for clubs. But um, basically, uh, for me, when I've sort of gone through, I've um, gone through a lot of, a lot of my clubs of, originally wanted tried to extend and the club had every intention of um, trying to extend me but for a variety of different circumstances at different in different um, scenarios wasn't wasn't able to be um, so then from there you know it's basically about your manager um, basically going out and seeing who's interested and then I suppose they come back to you, you you decide where your priorities lie, like where you want, you know, your first pick. Ideally, if you know, if I, I know I know I can't stay now, I'd love to go here, you know, and you sort of you know, you try and put them in order of where you want to go and then you sort of weigh up weigh up, you know, all, all the, the outside external things, the money, you know, the lifestyle of where you gotta go. You know, if you're moving, um, you know, the Tom I suppose the yeah the big move for that, especially now once you've got a family and and things like that, because it's not just you picking up and going. It's you know if you've got kids in school, you're moving moving your kids, you're taking them away from friends, and you know so there's a whole lot more goes into it. And then obviously if you can come to a an agreement with another club, then you know that gets done, and 
you know, the next yeah. year, first day of training, you walk in the door and meet the boys and get going again. So for you, do you look at the player list, the team list they've got, the top 30 they got? Because, you know, you went from Melbourne, which is obviously Melbourne, then you went to Warriors and they made the grand final while you're there. Then you went to the Roosters, done reasonably well, let's put it that way. Then you went to Cronulla, won a grand final there. Was that like you saw the playlist and saying, oh, they could actually do something or you just saying you're a lucky charm or all you? Was it yeah, all you? no, I think, I think I've always had a, a good ability to um, sort of look at, look at a team and sort of, you know, uh, assess what they're capable of. I think different scenarios. Obviously, I left Melbourne originally uh, for an opportunity. I was sort of sat behind um, Cooper Cronk and Brett Finch there and, Played a couple of games where I just needed full-time first grade and got that at the Warriors. So that was more for an opportunity. Um, then obviously I I left New Zealand, came back to the Roosters. Um, you know, a big reason for leaving there was to come to come home and be closer to family. Um, and then yeah, I, I actually that year was probably the most I had. You know, an array of options. I went and met with that many clubs. It was ridiculous and you know that roosters just seemed I, th I thought they'd been underperforming they'd had a couple of not that good years but then this was really good which the roosters always you always have. look at a, yeah. they'll always good roster yeah so i just yeah i thought that um that was the right right fit um and then obviously I had a lot of success there uh when i left there again cronulla what as soon as uh, some things happened and I knew I wasn't going to be able to stay at the Roosters. Cronulla was my next pick because I knew, you know, they had a really strong forward pack. That's always something yeah. that I need to, you know, as a halfback, that's something that I need if I'm going to uh, go play for a side. I need a strong forward pack because if I'm going to play good footy, I need, I need a pack that can go forward and allow me to do that. So um, I think that was the pick from there. So, yeah, I, I don't think it's all luck. I think I'm, you know, I'm pretty, you know, uh, what can I find, what I think I, what, what I think I can add um, to that side and, yeah, going from there and then, yeah, we've managed to have a fair bit of luck along the way. So, have, with, have with you your ability, you with your ability to look at team lists, would you consider being a coach later? Yeah, look, that's something I've, uh, probably since I got to Penrith, when I first went to Penrith, it was it's something that's really you know appealed to me. Now I obviously went out there as a as an older player and with a real young playing group, and uh, yeah, the young boys just just hang off you know what you tell them and learn from you, and they're asking you things, and you know you start talking to them, and a, a lot of them say like you'd be really good at, at coaching, and and then even the you know, because I suppose with anything, the thing you get that changes when you leave footy is you get so much enjoyment and so much satisfaction out of playing footy that you want to go into something in a career that gives you something as well. It's not just about earning money and earning a paycheck, but you want to be getting something out of it. And I think going to Penrith and seeing, you know, how excited I used to get for, to see and play with young boys making their debuts and things like this, you know, and, you know, you sort of remember, you go, geez, that was a long time ago, but I remember when this was me and, you know, you start getting a real buzz out of that. And I feel like coaching, coaching would be a lot the same, you know, you, whether you, whether you find this young kid or you improve this young kid and whether it's a kid making their debut, whether it's someone who you've done some work with them and they go on to representative honours and things like that. I feel like you just get a bit of a, a buzz. Of, no, that you've played some sort of role in yeah. in helping them get that. So I, yeah, I think I think it is now. It's something yeah that I'll definitely look to after after I finish up. Yeah. Have you um, when you talked about the valuation? Have you ever overvalued yourself and gone to that with a with a club and you got the value that you were looking for and then have gone suckers? <laughs> or have you ever under <laughs> oh, or, or have you ever undervalued yourself? <laughs> And the club's like, yep, we'll take that. And you kind of go on, oh, bugger. <laughs> yeah, no, look, I, I think I think with the value, all, all of it is supply and demand. So, you, you know, it's it's one thing for you to 
say I'm worth this or I'm worth that. You you can basically only go off probably, you know, a like minded, you know, what other um, you know, players in that players position, in that position are, yeah. are, are at and around at that time and, and what they've done and where you see yourself. I've I don't think I've ever I've never gone into a club to try and rip them off and be like and try and get, you know, a ridiculously amount you know, yeah, amount okay. of money I think was fair. But then I was also at the point where it is it is a business and, you know, I'm I'm not gonna also accept something that I think is just way below what what I actually deserve. So yeah, I don't I don't think I've ever overvalued myself and I I've never well I've never really been to the point where it was I oh, we've demanded this or I've said, Oh, this is what I want and people have yeah. just said no. Nah not possible there's been scenarios that go look you know that's definitely fair but we just cannot do it with salary cap and stuff like that but um yeah I, no i don't i don't think I, I don't think i have i don't think i'm that sort of person to um do that and i suppose the other thing is if you if you overvalue yourself and take a whole lot now you got to understand that you know especially as a halfback you know what you require around you uh, the players around you, um, you know, to help you play well, then that's all coming out of the same pie. You know, there's only so much pie, and the bigger the slice <laughs> you you take, the less the less you've got to, you know, if, to share if around. clubs need certain positions, they they just can't get the top quality ones that you might want to be playing with. So, okay, so with all this ability that you have to evaluate a team list, have you run the had a look at all the team lists, the NRL now, and had a look at a team gone, oh, they could look good in a few years? Or is there a team out there right now that not many people think of in the top four that you're like, oh, I'd like to see that? And following on from that, can you give us an exclusive who's reached out to you to come over during the coronavirus? At the end, no. <laughs> <laughs> First bit, no, one, no one's reached out to me about... <laughs> You mean about coming back? Yeah, yeah just, coming back. So. Uh, some, I think someone asked me one time and someone said, I said, I, uh, I think it's like a, well, might sound good in theory, but I just think logistically, I don't even think it's possible. Like you're still yeah. in a contract. And and then the other thing is, you know, I suppose the only thing that would maybe lure someone would be big money, but obviously there's going to be massive cuts with yeah, what's yeah. going on. On, so I don't even, you know, if you're going back for a short-term contract, I can't imagine there'd be that much, um, you know, financial gain there. So, no, that um, in terms of playing, playing lists, current playing lists. Um, Who's a team you reckon that could that not many people would see, but you can see that they're reasonably good, like a lot better than people are rating. Yeah, right. Um, geez, that's a good one. Um, someone who's probably, yeah, or might have been underperforming and yeah, think and it could be better than what they are. Um, because I really want you to come to Newcastle. This time. <laughs> that's what he was, I was leaning towards it. Yeah, all right. So, here's the thing so, in Newcastle, how I think because I feel like a lot of people obviously they they had had some big signings and things like that yeah that are obviously going to help but i and people would say oh i think they might make the the eight now or i mean you know stuff like that but i i think the one thing that well i suppose an easy way to explain it to someone else it's like okay you look at a newcastle side that and then take say a top four side all right so take the premiers the roosters and yeah. then look at the Newcastle side and you said, okay, if you had all the whole Roosters squad and the whole Newcastle side and you had to pick your top 17, how many Newcastle players do you put in that side? That's exactly how biased am I allowed to be? <laughs> well, Jared, that's exactly what we did last year. That's yeah. what kind of, that was actually the exact starting point of this podcast. And, and there's a thing like that where you go, okay, yeah, they do. But then you look across and you say, look, there's, there's, you know, when when they were struggling and going through this time, the, if we're you're completely honest, there's a lot of players that yeah. wouldn't that were playing first grade that wouldn't have been at other clubs, would not have been yeah. playing first grade footy. Yeah. So it's a hard mix, and it's one thing. I think I think it's also it's, it's a real talent of a 
coach or it's, it would be such a hard position as a coach because when a side's not going well, you don't want to, you've got to find positives and you've got to, you know, because you can, there's no point, you're not going to get any reaction out of players if every week you get beat and you go into video and you just beat them down, beat them down. You yeah. didn't, do, didn't do that because, you know, they're flat enough anyway, losing every week. Like that's a, that's a hard thing to go through, let alone do that. Yeah. So you get this mix of um, trying to trying to keep confidence up and, and give them confidence and build stuff, but then probably not also being able to address some things that need, to be, yeah. need to be addressed because you don't want to, you know, where is that going to get you? So it, I think it puts you in a really hard situation for, for a coach and then... I feel like if players, if then by not addressing those things, then they sort of become standards that are accepted, and and some players might not even be aware of them. Yeah, you know, if they're small little things, unless they've been pointed out to them, might not even be aware of uh, where they're at. So I, I think there's all sorts of things like that that are that are very tricky in that scenario. So it, it, with all that, how much comes on to the senior players to be like, no, this is a standard we've got to come to? Because, you know, Newcastle signed, who did they sign? Before all that they, before all that big influx, they signed people like Aiden Guerra, who obviously came from the Melbourne to the Roosters and to Newcastle. So he would have been sitting there like, well, this is completely different from what I'm used to. So how much is the senior players got to stand up in that moment and go, no, this is how it's got to be? Like, yeah, definitely. I think, I think everywhere you go, where there's strong, we have a strong side, and uh, I think it's it's not um, it's not fluke that there's normally a strong um, group of leadership players and and the right personalities because it's not always just really good top quality players. Sometimes it, it's the personalities that you need that are that are prepared to do that, and you know because it. There might, there's also, there's a lot of good players that, you know, will, will sort of take, or are not, are not always the best ethical players, you know, in terms of work ethic and skipping corners and doing that. And, and, we'll, and we'll have, da- and we'll have days where, where they, they miss things like that. So it's, again, it's a hard thing. If you're not that sort of player, it's hard because for you to hold other players accountable for that. You need to do it all the time. Otherwise, if you're if you're trying to tell young players to do something and they see you not doing it, then you lose all credibility straight away. Yeah. Cool. So that that becomes a yeah that becomes a challenge as well. So I'm just going to put a, a point there and then move us on a bit. That when you said the best seventeen of two teams, that was literally a conversation Jared and I had towards the end of last season. Um, which was the the makings of this podcast where Penrith were getting a lot of press throughout the season. Um, Manly were picked as wooden spooners and Newcastle was picked somewhere in the middle. And me being a Manly fan, Jared being a uh, a Knights fan, we sat down and went, why is Penrith getting all of this talk and Manly's getting this talk and Newcastle's getting this talk? And we literally lined the three Rosses together. And you... You were still the best five, You you were still, so... (laughs) You and Kickout were the only two I'm Panthers players. Anyway. Yeah. <laughs> so, like, out of all the teams, you and Kickout were the only two Penrith players that we'd put ahead of any of the other positions. It was interesting. We were just sitting down going, this is how we we do things. It was interesting that you'd say that that's one of the exact things you'd do, looking between a, a top four and a um, uh, outside the top eight. Now, something you just touched on then, personality-wise, you've always had a... Uh, What's the word? Uh, Outgoing, outspoken. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I was, I was going to like a um, a unique sort of aura or personality is what I was going for. And just from research and from what other players have said, it's more teammates who are annoyed of you rather than the opposition. Would that be fair? Yeah, I think I think it's one of like everyone says they are oh, Jimmy's a pest sort of thing yeah. and good. Right? But I also I think it's all. Everyone says it. I think it's a good-hearted yeah, test. Yeah, yeah. Like I've, you know, in, in terms of that, like I think it's e- an easy thing for people to be like, oh, no, nah, like they get sick of him. I said, no, they did. 
you know, I've got I've got good friends with at all the clubs, and I've never left. Or I've never had a fallout with any players in terms of things like that, you know. But it, but I get like again, it's you know, I I do like like to have fun. I, you know, there's still probably since I've been at school, um, you know, still probably haven't nailed exactly the the time and place for certain things, but. <laughs> But I, I, that's how I've that's how I've been, and I've never I've never tried to change or you know Luke. be any different. Everyone, that's that's who I am, yeah. and you know, you know, that's just how it is. Is there, what's the if you're going into like say say Origin camp, right? Um, when you played Origin, was there a a player who's almost like the complete opposite to you? So someone who's just very just straight down the line, very focused, very. Blinkers on yeah, sort of thing, and they've Maloney, just gone. I don't want to room with Maloney. <laughs> there, there's, there's plenty, and I think, but I feel like oh, probably in that room, and then that not too bad and stuff. But there's definitely I've played with millions of players that I get on really well. That are especially say game day, you know, when you yeah. get to game day and they're just oh, serious as you know, everything like that. But then there, there's a time where I just stay clear because obviously game day. Game day is something where, you know, I'm more interested in, I'm not interested in, you know, choking around or stuffing up with him. I just want him to be ready to play his yeah. best, you know, when we go out there. But around training and there, 100%, we take the mickey out of those sort of blokes all the time. <laughs> because they're just so so serious and so down the line. And I think that's always, you've got to, you've got to have fun doing what you do. Like yeah. there's... And and I've always you know been like that, and I've always loved having fun and loved the camaraderie, you know, that that footy brings and and the mateship and stuff like that. So, can you think, give you know, us a, can you give us a player like that you've just mentioned and something specific that you've done during a training session or off the field away from a game day that still makes you laugh? Um, an exact. Thing. No, I think I think an exact thing's hard. I think it's like it's like it's not like necessarily big pranks or stuff like that. But I just feel like there's you know obviously there's chat about you know different stuff goes on in with deep, different yeah. people's. If you ever get wind of something and you can g them up, then they just become <laughs> this constant banter and g ups. It sort of you know, and I suppose if you try or you try to think of one and probably doesn't even sound that funny, but yeah. you know just in the group of mates and pick you know when you can get guys and there's 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 days where you get if you get a bloke at the right time where where you can just wear them down that quickly and, and just drive well, them up but you know i don't i don't you can't have you can't have a um thin skin if you're in a football team i don't think it's possible nah. i just love um, how so, you were laughing through that whole answer that was the best <laughs> <laughs> so leading into that so obviously this is the first time, well, what, like the first fortnight that me and Adam are doing this kind of stuff. The interviews. Um, yeah. yeah, the interviews. So last, when I was with, when we did did it with Kyle Flanagan, I said a line that after the after it happened, I got like mixed messages from everyone. Can't you can't say that kind of stuff? Come on, they mate, weren't mixed messages. That. They were straight down the line messages. <laughs> yeah, just what the hell? Um, <laughs> it was. It, oh, I stand by it. it. Is what it was, but um, how much media training do you guys get? Because I just said that off. Like, how much media training do you guys get to not say ridiculously inappropriate and stupid <laughs> things to the media where it goes on the front line, the headlines? Yeah, and stuff well, like I think that. that. Yeah, I think that there's also and, and different people are, yeah, you know, different. Say where the coaches or whatever probably have different things where they try. There's definitely if. I suppose, especially if there's something controversial has, has gone yeah. on, and I feel as hate, then obviously, you know, clubs addressing it, it needs to be a look. You know, we just can't comment at the moment. Things like that, or or ways to address it. Um, I probably, you know, there's things. It's probably something I've naturally never really done. I like got uh, probably players that are uncomfortable. You know, fronting cameras and being able to give answers and things like that. They're just not comfortable in that. Then, you know, there's definitely stuff where, where clubs will try and help them just just make it a bit easier and more comfortable for them like that. But in terms of, you know, just stuff like that, I, I think it's, again, it's something I've always 
sort of said, you know, like I'm more than happy to go out and, and crack a joke and, and do something. Mm -hmm. I don't think I've ever, you know, crossed a line like that where it's like something inappropriate that you shouldn't have said or it's yeah. a, or something like that, you know. It might have bordered, bordered on the line sometimes. But <laughs> And again, I was like, a, it's just something I've, I've never felt uncomfortable, like just sitting there fronting questions or doing something like that. And then, you know, I just figure at the end, I go, there's, it's a, it's a catch-22 because clubs, clubs don't want players to, you know, give too much or if, you know, obviously people say, you know, if you're talking about the opposition, they say, we don't want to give them anything that they can use, you know? Yeah, yeah. So they, they, their coach can go to them and say, look what he said, and they just, you know, that fuels them for the next three days before they come out and play it, you know? Um, but then I also get, the, and there's a part of it that, you know, it's like people people don't want to hear the same boring shit. And, yeah, they don't want robots. And stuff like that. So, it, you know, so uh, it's, it's a bit of a catch-22 where, you, you know, you sort of, and the, and the media, and then again, you know, as soon as someone does say something a bit, then yeah. the media they throw it out and make a big deal out of it. So it makes players then go, oh, okay, well, I won't say that. So it's a, yeah, it's a bit of a mix and understanding, but it, it's, it's something, I said, half the stuff that I've said, I've, I never actually read it. So I wouldn't, wouldn't know what gets said and, and stuff because I've never really been one to read, read whatever's in the papers. Yeah, so... Was there ever a player you played with who the club were like, you are not allowed to talk to the media? Was there any, was there anyone ever that's like, nah? Nah, not, not that you couldn't. And I, I suppose, especially later on with the new rules, like they they brought in, like I think you had to have one day where everyone was available and things like that. So, um, well, you hear obviously different scenarios where young kids come through or whatever and clubs would put them on media bands to sort of shield them and protect them a little bit from stuff like that but I don't I, I think these days you can't really do it yeah. I remember when I was a real young fella at Parramatta Fui Fui Moi Moi used to oh, be the yeah. best because whenever he went up he just went oh sorry no English no English <laughs> 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 And just played it off, but yeah, no, I don't. I think I think these days it's yeah, it's a lot harder. He's a cult well, figure in the Super League, isn't he? When he was there, he was like, um, he said, jump into the grandstands after a try if he scored one, and just run up into the seats. There's a couple of videos of him doing that. I think he's been a bit of a cult hero, old oh, fool. Yeah, good. Yeah, uh, what, what about your barbecuing alone statement? Yeah, well, that was. <laughs> That was up that just got completely blown out of the water. It was a bit of a laugh and, and all that. And I was like, it was actually probably like that. It was just sort of a, you know, throw off sort of line and, you know, and a bit of a laugh. And then I was down the track. I was like, fair income. Like, it just never stopped. Like, if I had a dollar every time someone mentioned that to me, hey, I'd be living on the, I'd live, be living on Bondi Beach. It's yeah, no, it's just, um, it was, you know, you just broke out on the, the footy show and it was just kind of blown up and I was wondering if it was planned or bloody, you know. Well, I had, I had I, I'd seen it so because a lot of people have said, oh, how'd you come up with it? I said, it wasn't anything. I Like, I didn't create the term. I said, I actually, you remember the show Two and a Half Men? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so it was on that one time. I remember I used to love watching that. And then, I, and then when I heard it, it like cracked me up and I... So I just, I'd remember it because I thought it was funny, like a <laughs> funny way to do it. So then obviously I got the scenario where I had, you know, that was embarrassing moments and then that was what I was thinking of. So that's yeah. just how I, how I worded it. And oh, then that's so yeah, good. It blew up. Um, so we've got, it's a couple of minutes till this meeting finishes. We'll have to log back in after that. But just for the second part, just want to talk about, Jared mentioned right at the start, so he played with six clubs, Melbourne Warriors, Roosters, Cronulla, Penrith, Catalans, and from 2009 to 19, 247 first grade matches, and your winning percentage is 60%. And that's like, I'll Did go you know that? for more. I think, I think it popped up, because I, I think it must have been, must have been people posting, I had some mates or something post up about, yeah, like the top, like the most winning. And I think from memory, there were some Melbourne guys or whatever ahead. But yeah, I think, I think it's, I suppose, 
they're, they're guys that have always stayed at a club, the Melbourne, that's been very successful the whole time. But to be able to move around and have that, like, yeah, it's, it's pretty cool. Was that, have you always um, kind of felt like you like that, regardless of like what activity it is? Is it a competitive thing? Like say you're playing table tennis, you want to win, you have to win. <laughs> or is it something that you had maybe from like a family member when you were younger or a coach? Or is it kind of a combination yeah. of both? Yeah, no, it's definitely something I've had since a kid. And, you know, I remember my uncles and that used to always say, he goes, the amount of times, you know, you'd get bowled out first ball in cricket and wouldn't go and throw the bat. And, like, I'm, I'm a horrible loser, I always have been. And it's actually, I said, it's funny, I said, so many of my kids are like that now. Like, we'll go play a game and then they just spit it if they lose. And I think, I feel like, obviously, as I've got older, I've curbed it a bit and, I, you know, you can sort of get over things, but I just think, oh, my God. And then all, all Jess ever says to me, my wife just goes, well, where do you reckon they get that from? You know, <laughs> like, we have meltdowns all the time. As soon as we start playing a game and as soon as someone, one of them lose, oh, they're cheating, that's not fair, bang, there's a massive blow up. <laughs> so it, is your wife at a point where she's just not playing against you anymore because she's sick of it? Or? <laughs> <laughs> well, she's actually, it's funny, because she's actually... She's got a competitiveness in her as well. So when she, <laughs> if we're playing something and she finds something that she beats me at, because she says, she goes, there's not much, but when I do, then she gets so much joy out of it because it pisses me off so much. <laughs> <laughs> right, we'll go with it. So bringing into the state of origin kind of atmosphere, career. So a couple of things. Um, Comparison between Daly and uh, and Fittler. So you played in um, 13, 16 to 19 under, so three under Daly, two under Fittler. Difference in coaching style, difference in personalities, um, obviously all winning under Fittler, all losing under Daly. What was the... Yeah. Cook, yeah, biggest difference, I guess, in their coaching styles or personalities? Oh, look, I suppose, I suppose probably the biggest difference, I suppose, was, um, well, Freddie, Freddie had a, when he come in, but obviously he also had, was actually quite out there and basically selected a really whole new young team. So that yeah. obviously a thing, I think, you know, in terms of coaching, I, I really enjoyed playing under Laurie, you know, re really thought, you know, again, when you get to origin, it's not about, mm. it's not all about the technical, you know, the most astute, it doesn't have to be. It's people that understand origin and basically you've got all these good players. It's not about trying to give them this real technical game plan. It's just about making sure everyone's on the same page and you're ready to go and understand what playing origin and, and what you're playing for. And I, I think both Freddie and Laurie were really good at that. Um, I think in terms of coaching styles, I, I feel like probably the only difference was Freddie left it pretty much like he was a big, uh, you know, investor in just play, like literally no set, no setups, and um, you know, everyone get wide, get in shape, and if there's something there, pass the ball, you know, and and be willing to, you know, back yourself to pass the ball and back yourself to catch a ball under pressure and things like that. You know, that was probably the biggest thing. Um, you know, when we played with with Laurie and that, we were probably, um, you know, we weren't very, really structured, but we had a, we had a basic sort of outline and game plan. Um, so coaching styles, I suppose that's probably the only difference. Um, but yeah, I, I think it was, it was, yeah, that, that would be the big, um, I suppose the difference in, in terms of their styles and coaching, I think so. they enjoyed playing under both of them and I think they both understood origin and what it was about and things like that. But um, yeah, I, I suppose there's, and the, probably the results and how it all happened, obviously, you know, there was some, Freddie made some, some really, some really big calls and some calls that I suppose if you look at them, you know, they're, they're some pretty ballsy calls to, yeah, Latrell Mitchell Coach. being the, probably the first one that pops pops up to your mind. Yeah, and even, and even before that, you know, it's basically, you know, the first year he come in as a rookie coach in 
the Origin Arena, and he picked what did he pick nine debutants yeah. or something? Oh, that's unheard of. You know what I mean? So I suppose for that, he's he's, he's someone who I suppose for for the guys there, he 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 backed he backed these guys that he picked, and obviously, <clears throat> you know that that probably gave them you know an enormous amount of belief going into their first origins that you know someone's you know picked them like that to do the job and you know again you know Laurie, Laurie probably probably had it you know he, he was obviously the one you know Laurie was a coach when they first first broke that drought um you know and then um yeah then obviously had a few more mm. series but yeah there was also like we played in three like I remember at least two of those were like yeah I think we like Oh, they're really close, yeah. So you said about the um, debutants having a lot of confidence going into it that Fittler gave to them. When you saw the team list as a player coming back to Origin, were you like, holy crap, what's going on here? There's so many new debutants, Or you're like, those are pretty good players. We'll be, we'll be all right. How, yeah, what was your reaction? They're all, they're all players in form. So they're all playing really good footy. So that... That gives you confidence because you're obviously playing against these blokes and you're seeing them play, so you know they're all playing in in form. And then I suppose, as I said, when we, when we got there and just started playing, I think it, it just gelled really really well. You know, obviously you had a few guys that had been there before, and um, you know then I had all these guys that had this all excitement, but then they they still sort of look to you guys that have been there before and ask you questions about it or what to expect and through the week and and stuff like that but it was just it was just a a really really good it just ended up that those couple of years with those really um young guys we ended up we we were so tired like mm. for the small amounts of time we spent together there was just such a good feeling you know in in that group and and all that and um yeah i think I think that's sort of bread, you know, Freddie, I big thing Freddie said, like his thing, thing was, you know, do something for your mate. Don't worry, you know, don't do anything for yourself. Everything you do is, is for, for someone else. And yeah, we just, it just bred this, this real culture of, you know, a real, real bond and real tightness. So I think when Daly took over, it was the first time you'd see Queensland supporter. It's, um, it was probably the first time where north of the border, we're like, oh, New South Wales finally gets it. So it's kind of <laughs> like, no, but you know, you know exactly what I'm saying. It was always the Queensland were the first one on a loose ball. They were the ones who just played to the last, was all that sort of stuff, even though the talent was pretty even. It was when Daly, when they selected Daly and then, yeah, you didn't get the results straight away. And then Fittler, as a Queensland supporter, going, well, they finally get it, what, what Origin's about. It's exactly what you just talked about then, the, the culture, the do everything for your mate. It's the, the management, the camaraderie all that sort of stuff and um yeah. you know jared and i tried to pick our origin teams a couple of weeks back jared had his done in like a click and i'm sitting here going man this new south wales team's looking pretty good <laughs> again so it hasn't been like that for a for a fairly long time so it's um i think everything that you've just said pretty much backs that up so when, when yeah. did this go went over the line last year how long did you party after no. <laughs> and how, how much did, did, did you get a phone call from the Roosters going, oh, hey, mate, you got to come back. <laughs> oh, no, sorry, from Pembroke. Sorry, yeah. You get a phone no. call like, hey, where are you? No, nah, we're all pretty good. So I think we went trying to think what day it was because obviously, um, yeah, Penrith and Nathan, Nathan was involved. Obviously, he, he was uh, unable to play that game with uh, yeah. injury and and so Nathan had been involved, so it might have been. It was one of them. I can't remember when, but it was we we were playing on the back cup or whatever. Because obviously you, you play the even because it was game three. It was a Wednesday again, so it wasn't the sad day. And I think we we had the back up. Uh, I can't remember what game anyway or what day. But Ivan rang me one morning because obviously we got on the piss all that night and. <laughs> hadn't slept or whatever and he called me the next day and he said oh have you have you had any sleep and i said no <laughs> <laughs> and he and, well, it must have been that because then he then he said um i think we had captains run maybe that after 
<laughs> that would have been rough. And I knew, but I knew I was like, because they weren't, I said, it wasn't really going to be me running around or doing much, you know, I would have been going for a massage and doing that. Um, and I, I said to him, because originally I thought, I thought, oh, I just won't do that. I'll just come up to game. But he said, oh, no, it'd be good if you could come in. Just just show your face, see the boys and all that. So I think he just said, he goes, go home, have a have a little kick and then, and then come in and, and see us, you know, not, not doing much, but, but just come in and show your face. So when so, he did that. When you weren't sleeping all night, who was leading it? Was it Fittler leading it? Because... <laughs> Who, who's the, who was the biggest guy just like everyone has to stay awake and keep it? Was that you? Who no, was it? there's a few. Boydie Cordner's pretty rock solid like that. He, <laughs> he doesn't, doesn't mind a party and, and can drink, mate. Freddie, Freddie enjoys, you know, I think anyone's heard the stories of Freddie as he was coming yeah. through, was, although he been pretty wild and that. So, no, Freddie enjoys it. and But that's that's part of it, you know, that's yeah. part of you it. it. You've got to enjoy it. So it's, even you know, even the fact that you're going back to play at clubs two, three, four days later, I don't even think clubs, you know, anyone at any club would have any issue with it. You know, it's just an understanding that that's what you do and you go and have a good drink or whatever. And then even if you're playing two days later, it's well, well, you've still got a job to do for your club, and um, that that was something that you know, even every time I played Origin under. Laurie and Freddie, that was something they were always big on, that you go back and you represent your clubs and you play well for them. Um, you know, that you, you don't just play Origin, go back and, and play rubbish for your clubs. How, how hard was to... it backing up? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah sorry. How, yeah, how... Uh, it's, a, it's a weird... A lot of guys different. So I found that a lot of guys used to prefer, prefer like, the Friday backup because they reckon the... Two days was better because all the soreness hadn't fully kicked in and um, done that yet. And they reckon by three or four days was actually harder. But I was a little bit the opposite. You know, I, I thought it was hard. It was hard regardless. And I just thought every day helped you that little bit more. So uh, I think different people say different stuff. But it definitely, it, it's definitely a challenge when you finish that next game on the back up. Like you just, yeah, you're knackered. So I've got two two questions that kind of link with each other. First one's about State of Origin 1, 2018. So you've just passed the ball to... You're doing a backline move just out of the Queensland line. Valentine Holmes kicks it off, intercepts it, runs down the other end, scores. And um, there was a quote, well, not a quote, or something that you were yelling out, first one back behind after throwing the ball, and you said... Don't fucking worry about it. We're on top. There's no point any of us worrying about it. And then later in that half, um, sorry, early in the second half, you threw a forward pass that then led to another Maroons try. And I think it was Cleary was the one that they talked to about it. And he's saying, you just shrug it off. Don't worry about it. Whereas he was saying, man, that'd be in my head all game. Was that, I could read some of more of the... Um, language out here there's a lot of f's and lots of fuck ups and there's no point saying sorry um and then jared saying gus gould's quote was he's got the worst memory and it's like a gift how, how do you like a lot of people say you make a mistake you learn from it you get past it but how do you do it in such a atmosphere like that yeah i don't i don't know it's it's something to me uh, I know, like to me, it's just so nat natural. Like I, again, I, you know, and people have said about obviously throwing that ball where Val intercepted it, and I said I've I've looked at it like seeing the replays. I said I, if you gave me put me in that situation ten more times, I said I'd throw the pass ten more times because I could I couldn't even see Val. Like he he'd come from like meters behind GI. I was throwing it to Jimmy Roberts who was outside GI, and I thought mate, we'll go in here two on one. And he's picked it off. So I was like, you know, I'd, I'd throw it all again. And, you know, it's just something to me, my head goes to, well, I can't change that. There's no point in me worrying about, oh, geez, like I've done that or that that was wrong or that was an error because you're, you're never going to play the perfect game of footy anyway. So, you know, if you make an error and I go and make two, two positive plays and, you know, then hopefully, you know, 
two positives, take off the one error, and I'm I'm in the positives. You know, <laughs> so I just I just think it's something like that, and a lot of people have asked, but that's how I see it, and I don't. I, obviously, different people struggle, you know, to to sort of have that. But to me, it's like, well, what am I going to get out of going back and stressing, or you know, or killing myself that I, you know, I did that. Like I've done it. I can't change it. I can't do anything. You know, the only thing I can now change is what I'm about to do for the next however long for the game. So that's just how, how my mind goes. And again, to me, it just seems so natural. So I think Jared and I said. Uh, we both agreed it was the right play and it wasn't so much the intercept but it was the the reaction that you were just talking about behind the try line and the first one back in there um there's not i don't think they're just not many players if they'd been the one throwing the pass they'd be the first one back there going don't fucking worry about it let's get into them we're on top and you were i remember that game going shit we needed that with with homes run away and but i think exactly right and that's what it because it was and you didn't Obviously, this was this year. We had all these young guys. I didn't want these young guys going, oh, whatever. Like, I just want, like, we were on top. We were, we had all the running. We were doing that. So, you know, it's easy for, you know, people to be yet, you know, distracted and start going, oh, wow, you know, we've had all this. And instead of going back to, you know, fine thing, we were on top. We were doing everything right. We're doing, we just keep going and we'll do it. And, you know, it, it, proved, to, it proved to be right. All right, so I'm going to test your bad memory here. Let's have a look. So this is these are these are stats, your stats in the NRL from 2014 to 2018. So you're looking yeah. at uh, what's that? Roosters, Cronulla, and Penrith. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. So these are your stats. So 465. You did 465 of these in that time period. Miss tackles. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? It was in my head. I didn't want to say it to piss you off, but <laughs> <laughs> that's a that's an average of pretty much four a game. All right. Was that was that what it was? Miss yeah, Miss Tackles. <laughs> so yeah. I, I got one for you. My little brother is an is an amazing <laughs> Pembroke fan. Absolutely loves Pembroke. And he reckon I said that to him one day and he's like, you know what? He slows them down. <laughs> he might fall off, but he slows him down, which everyone else well, comes in. It's a, it's a weird thing because I like I get, and I know, and I've been through this thing. There's obviously, you know, you don't want all these mini tackles, but how some of them are scattered are so deceiving because yeah. you can literally, I can literally hit a bloke, he fall on the ground, but not stick and bounce off. And then the two guys either side of me just land on him. I get put down as a missed tackle because I didn't finish the tackle. Yeah. So there's, there used to be ones, I was like, I, obviously it was something that you always wanted to, you know, you didn't want to have all this huge amount. But then there was also ones where I used to think, well, like, I, I thought I defended quite well and they still had me as five misses or something like that. And, you know, but then, you know, no one ever looked like scoring, you know, around us or down our edge. So it's just all one right. of those things. I never really oh, worried just, much about just it. Just before you go, Adam, yeah. I asked this Kyle Flanagan as well. If a young halfback came up to you and goes, who's the worst second row to defend against? Who would you say it was? Um, to defend against, like to just have running at you all day. Yeah. I've always said the hardest bloke I used to find from a long time ago was Dave Taylor. Yeah, sure. He, he used to be a nightmare because he wasn't, he wasn't just straight up and down. He wasn't someone that was just going to try and run over you. He, he, would, he could actually, like, he was fast, so he, he could actually stop and try and burn you on the outside. And then he could offload, he could do, and then his legs were that big, you couldn't actually even get your legs up, your arms around him. Oh, Jesus. And, and he had he some used, knees on him, too. Yeah, I was like, he used to be a nightmare when I explained. What about, on that same one, before I come back, um, a skilled forward? So someone you'd be running at you, and you weren't maybe so... Uh, I'm not going to say worried because they're freaking massive anyway. Yeah. But you're going... Yeah, Glenn, Glenn Stewart. Glenn Stewart, easy. Yeah, cool. Yeah. Far, far and away, yeah, Glenn Stewart. All right, Mass so in that same time period, 465 missed tackles, you did 130 of these. 130. Penalties. 
Yes, 1.1 a game. Jeez, he's good. He's good. <laughs> Find something positive, Adam. Jesus. I do, I do. That's what I'm leading into. They're That's what I'm leading into. They're all the we're, lower numbers. Yeah, yeah. Were, were, you, so, were you ever told in your career, stop? Like, <laughs> no, no, no. no. What, <laughs> this, is, this is what I'm getting to. Okay, so, okay. So in that time period, 465 missed tackles at pretty much four a game, 130 penalties at one a game. Now I'm going to give you three numbers, and these are percentages. So you've got <laughs> 68.5, 64.7, and 71.66. Now one of them is you, and two of those other numbers are two other players. What does that percentage represent? Percent, oh, percentage of, oh, wow. We, well, we, got we've referred to it earlier in the show already. For your career Winning percentage. Yeah. Winning percentages. So in that same period of the um, four missed tackles, one penalty. Well, I'm going to go the 71, the top one. 71. <laughs> ah, one. close. You were, number, you were number two, only to one person in the whole NRL in that time. Cam Smith. Yeah, 71.66. And the third player at 64.7 was Jonathan Thurston. Yeah, right. So not, for, not so, bad company for that time period. So what, like, what you're saying is, what you're saying is. That's your two positives penalties. are better than the negative. What 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 you're saying is the more penalties and missed tackles, the better win percentage you've got. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> That's what we should tell young children. <laughs> they don't coach that. <laughs> and that's good. I just I just found that um I just found that really interesting because as a as a Queensland fan and and a Manly fan, I've never supported any team that you've played for, but you've never been <laughs> one of those players that. Um, I've ever had anything against because you're bloody great to watch and, and you always play with your heart on your sleeve and you and you can see that when you watch TV. If you make a mistake, you're the first one up chasing. It's like one of the best um, lessons for kids to watch and anyone who watches rugby league to watch. Um, and I just I just think those stats pretty much summed it up. You'll do whatever you can to win and errors are going to happen. So Yeah, yeah. I've only got one more. Um, you've you've played under Ivan Cleary, uh, McLennan, Trent Robinson, Flanagan, Griffin, Cleary again, and then um, Laurie Daly and Fitler. I'm not and sure McNamara. McNamara. Yeah. Oh, he's in there. Which coach has had the single most, uh, like the greatest positive influence on your game? And which yep. coach has had the greatest negative influence on your game? <laughs> well, I, I think I think for me, it's a positive one been really close. Um, I think I've said a few times. I think maybe um, Trent Robinson was probably the um, the most on me, and probably one of the best I've had. But then I also he probably just um, shades Bellamy because I spent three years under Robbo and I only had the 12 months down with Bellamy. Um, but under both those guys, learnt, learnt uh, an amazing amount of footy uh, about all different stuff. So I think, um, yeah, both those guys taught me. I think early on, um, down in Melbourne, Belly Ake showed me a lot. And I think I developed in that 12 months um, so much as a player. And then I think um, probably being that I progressed further along when um, got to Robbo for three years, and I think he just showed me probably a whole nother dimension of, of footy um, outside of outside of what I knew already, and you know a lot about the mental side of footy and um, mindsets and things like that. So yeah, they, they're probably the two um, in terms of. By the least, uh, I don't look. Uh, probably, I think we had, I had the year we had um, Brian McLennan at the Warriors was was not a good year, and I, I feel like um, we missed the mark a little bit there, a little bit in in terms of the you know, the way we did things. So, um, yeah, maybe maybe that. 
no, nothing nothing against him as a person, but I feel like, you know, I got on with him really well, but I feel like we just probably missed the mark. He, he was coming back from the Super League, coaching the Super League, and I, I think probably, you know, he just missed the adjustment um, going from from Super League to NRL. How, how have you liked the Super League? You played three games, I think, so far. It's got a try. What's it, um, yeah, I, what's it like? We played four. It's, four. Yeah, it's all right. <laughs> I've enjoyed it, you know. I think it's been it's been good. Um, it's been a good change. I've enjoyed getting over here and um, meeting all the new boys. And I think physically, it's been a little bit easier on the body um, for me, which has has been nice. Um, but you know, I'm still probably haven't got a full gauge of the exact difference um, between the two because I think as it comes into summer over here and you play through summer, then they say everyone sort of says, you know, once the fields are dry and all that, then the the footy's a lot more attacking, a lot more free flowing, and things like that. So probably haven't experienced that completely yet. So, um, but yeah, really enjoying it. You got a pretty stacked team, so and that's a team I support because that's who Menzies went and played for. So, I yeah. For you, 10, you, year, 10 years, he come over at, what, 30 and played for 10 years over here. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> loved it. What's he, up to, what's he up to the 500 mark or something? Of hey, he was, he was scoring like? he was scoring a try every two games when he was there. That's what he averaged out. Yeah, so, he's, he's a freak, mate, freak. So <laughs> you're, you're over there now. You, you played most of your career in Australia in Sydney, Sydney area. Do you like the idea that it's not such a rugby league freak town? Like Sydney's just, they call it a fishbowl in Sydney. Yeah. And then you go over to France and it's not so strong in rugby league. Are you liking the idea of that, that you can walk down the street and no one, or, or, do, do people know you when, when they walk down yeah, the street? Yeah, no, in terms of that, I love it. Absolutely yeah. love it. And you know what, every, you know, after the, um, the sides have played, when you play it, even talk to the guys in, in England, you know, that you play against that have come from Aussie. That's it's one of the massive draw cards that everyone says. They said, mate, it's just so low-key. Um, there's no pressure. You just go about your, your thing, you play. You, as you said, you, you know, the times you, when you're walking around here and you got recognised would be a dime a dozen. And you just, you know, the opportunities to, you know, even when we just got here in the short term, we've had little trips and getaways to different places, you know, been up to Monaco and Nice and oh. over to Bay Ritz and San Sebastian, down to Barcelona, on the Costa Brava, like all these things that are just so close and so cool and you just become a normal person, you know, going around travelling. So, yeah, that that side of it and being out of, as you said, the, the fishbowl and the pressure of NRL and footy, it's, yeah, awesome. So, how, how much... Did you did your wife get a say in going to Catalans? Let her, did you get any other interest from like England? But she's like, no, we're going to live in France. Well, we if I if I get a job in France, my partner will be all over that. Yeah, well, we had it was something that we spoke about um, early on. We'd always always said we wanted to come over and play in the Super League, and that obviously take the family over and travel Europe and all the stuff that um, you get, you know, because we, we said, if you finish footy and you know, we've got four kids and you want to take them on a European holiday, it'll cost you an absolute bomb, you know, but, you know, we've got, you know, in such a privileged position that we can go over there, play footy, and then in, in the spare time we can duck around and, and do all this. So it was something that we always wanted to do and we'd always spoke about, going to France, obviously for lifestyle in terms of weather and all that over north of England. Uh, we yeah, fair enough. We never we wouldn't wouldn't have gone to England, but the way it, the way it all sort of panned out anyway with me actually leaving a year before my contract with Penrith mm. was up, I we basically got a call from Steve McNamara one morning. Um, and he sort of said, Look, do you want do you want to come and you know, and then I sort of went and spoke to Penner from there. So we didn't really look at any other options because it was never really on the cards until uh, Mac called one morning and, and floated the idea. And then I went and spoke to Ivan and that at Penrith and 
um, yeah, it all went from there. So that was that was pretty much the only option we looked at over here. Well, on that positive note, I reckon um, I reckon we'll wrap it up, uh, Jimmy. That's um, it's been awesome. I know your arms probably sore from holding the phone up for that long. <laughs> Having to move around. A little weight session for the day. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, yeah, just from um, Jared and I in the Six Again podcast, just want to thank you again for coming on and I hope you stay safe and the family stays safe over there and yeah. um, you get to play a bit more footy and we get to watch you a bit more this year. Cheers. So easy, guys. It's been a pleasure. Thanks for the chat, eh? Thanks, Jet. Let's get it. No Catch you.